Good, Good morning, morning Cornerstone, Cornerstone Church. Church. That's, I still think that's so cheesy. Yeah, but, but I love it. <laughs> it's we're, fun. We're the only pastoral team that do that, I'm sure, in all I'm okay America. with that. <laughs> I am totally okay with that. So how are you? Uh, you? You told everybody here live that you sprayed perfume in your left eye? Yeah, that was just the people here, not for all of America. Oh, my bad. <laughs> So this morning, <laughs> I spray perfume in my eyeball after the makeup was done and I was in a hurry because I was running late because all of us women never run late and I had to put water in my eyeball so then all my makeup was off and I had to start over. Reason number 17,483 why I'm glad I'm a man. I am really glad you're a man, too. It makes well, my heart very happy. Now I'm blushing. So, <laughs> hey, welcome to Cornerstone Church this morning. We're so glad that you're here with us. Uh, those of you that are online, thank you for being with us and, and uh, being, uh, you're not just a part of church. Thanks for being the church. Yeah. And so we are so, so very, very grateful for you. Listen, we got a lot of announcements this morning, so we're going to kind of kind of do two-parter here. We're going to talk about some now, and then we'll talk about some after worship. Um, the real big thing uh, that uh, we, we just keep telling you is don't forget the wall. What's happening on Wednesday nights uh, has just been absolutely outstanding. Uh, and it's not just because uh, it's our pastoral team. Uh, just the Lord is just doing some powerful things, giving us some really awesome insights into prayer. And uh, we're, we're not, uh, somebody said, Pastor, we, we hardly ever pray. Uh, y- you know, that's the one, the one thing about prayer is sometimes you have to be taught. And it was so important because Jesus, said, when you pray, pray like this. And so that's what we're really talking about is, is not just uh, coming in and praying, but this is how you pray and talking about those things. So anyway, I think it's important us. too with that, if I can just mention that a lot of times when you are in that moment of prayer, and I know um, Pastor Man and I are now with our students on Wednesday nights downstairs, but um, for you and Pastor Jay, as you guys begin to talk and as leaders of the church, if you're missing out on that prayer time, you're missing out on some of the things that God is actually doing. Um, and what he wants to do in Cornerstone Church. And so sometimes it's easy to go, oh, it's just prayer. Right? Oh, it's just prayer. Just prayer. It's just prayer. (laughs) And so we don't show up because we just think, oh, it's just prayer. Oh, it's just Pastor Dan and Jay Jay talking again. (laughs) Right? But God does things in those moments, and God um, is excited about those moments, and he speaks things in those moments. So I just want to encourage you not to miss those because God is speaking life for Cornerstone Church, which is you. God is speaking things for the future, which is for you. So we just want to encourage you to be there. That's so good. On that note, I want to remind you that we are in the middle of 23 days of prayer and fasting. Today is day number seven. Uh, I've been going online, uh, on live uh, various times throughout the day uh, over the last several days. So you can catch me on my personal Facebook wall, and I have been sharing those to the Cornerstone page. Uh, you're, you're, you're not missing a teaching. It's just a kind of a word that the Lord's given me, and then we go after it. Uh, today, I'm going to be doing a live probably from the baseball diamond, okay? So that's my third favorite place to be in all of the world. So uh, I'm excited about that. That'll but be fun. We just continue, we just got to continue to stay in this place where we're praying and fasting for our nation, uh, for our churches, and for our families. We cannot quit that, okay? We got to continue to go go after that. Also want to make mention, Pastor Jen and I have been invited uh, to be a part of an area prayer meeting on Sunday, November 1st. Uh, that's going to be at 6.30. There's several area pastors that are going to be uh, on the platform together. I'm assuming social distance and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but if you'll join us, we'll, we'll have some of that material out for you as far as where you can. Uh, I'm not sure about the actual physical attendance as I get that detail. I will pass that on. But you for sure can go online to New Life Church in Lemonster. You can go to their Facebook page or you can go to their website and it'll be there. So uh, again, that's November 1st. That's the Sunday night right before the election. Uh, and so we're going to be just really going really, really you know, in for prayer for our nation. Again, our churches and our families. It's a kind of a thing that's happening without pastors yeah. talking about it. Yeah. We're all uh, kind of awesome, God's uniquely putting it all on, on the same page. So, really so cool. yeah, it's really yeah. good. Last thing, just want to uh, remind you of, if you have not connected with Right Now Media, please, 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 um, the numbers of you, I, I, and I'm not going to point anybody out, but the numbers of you that are sitting with us, and then I'm sure online as well, your names aren't active on there. So if you haven't gotten that, please let us know so we can get you, uh, give, give us an email so we can get you that invitation. You're, you're going to want to love that, especially if you're a mom and dad or grandparent, because there's 
all kinds of amazing uh, discipleship opportunities for children uh, on there. Right now, our, our little son, our seven-year-old, uh, since obviously he can't sit with his parents in church, he's sitting up in our office, uh, and he's doing right now media. He's on, and he's got lists of things that he likes to watch, and he goes there. So it's not YouTube. It's not cartoons. It's uh, things for the purpose for our kids in, in, in biblical bounds. Amen? Amen? So make sure you do that. Babe, would Can I you... talk about Operation Christmas? If you'd like to. Do you not want me to? No, go ahead. <laughs> you look like you were sad. Like no, you wanted no, to no, do no. It. So I'm excited. Who loves to fill a shoebox for the kids? Come on, get excited, right? We all love to do that. And we're all wondering, are we going to get to do that this year? The answer is absolutely a big, huge, all capitals, yes. Um, so we are super excited. It's going to look a little different this year, though, but I think the way they have set it up is really exciting. So um, I'm hoping you all have already received an email. If not, please contact Carrie here at the church, and she will get you um, situated at exactly where you need to go. But you get to go online, and you get to actually pick items and put it in a shoebox. It's just virtual. Well, just so you know, babe, it's already out there on our Facebook page, so they can Perfect. go right to the Cornerstone Facebook See, page and grab it. See, look how, like, advanced we are. Yeah. That is so good of us. Um, so we want you to go out there, and it's $25, and that's going to cover the items, and is that cover shipping as that's well? That's the whole so thing. So that's everything. So $25, you can do as many boxes as you want. If you are a parent or a grandparent, we want to encourage you to maybe get on there and do one for each of your children, maybe each of your grandchildren, if you don't have, like, 500. Um, um, and just something fun to sit down with them and do. You are never too old to do a box, amen? Because there are children that this is the only thing that they receive, um, maybe for the whole year, but for sure a lot of times just for Christmas. And so we want to be a, a giving church, amen? Because that's what Jesus calls us to. So we want to encourage you, go online, go fill out a couple shoe boxes. Um, super easy, super fun to be able to put your own items that you want in that box. So we want to encourage you guys to do that this morning. Not just, let's not talk about the one one book in. Let's talk about never too young to do one, Spencer Richardson. Ooh, come on, come Spencer. on Spencer. We know you're doing a box, right. little boy. So anyway, that's awesome. hey, I it's love so it. good to have. Well, babe, let's go right on into worship, sweetie. Would you just go ahead and pray for us, Absolutely. and and we'll just we'll just run into Jesus' presence. Absolutely, Jesus. We thank you so much for who you are. Yes, Lord. Jesus. I thank you that you love us unconditionally. Jesus, I thank you that you first loved us in our mess, in our brokenness. Yes. Jesus, that you loved us, that you died for us, Jesus. And God, what better way, Father, than worship to come into your presence, Lord, and to worship you, Jesus. What a better way to honor you today, God, and to give you all of our worship. And so, Jesus, today I pray, God, that we would surrender ourselves to you, Lord, Hallelujah. and that we would um, walk into your presence, Father, and that we would worship you today, Father. We would let all the cares of the world just fall, God, at our feet, Lord, and worship you today, Jesus. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your grace and your love and your peace and your mercy. In your name we pray. Amen. Please Amen. feel free to stand during worship as we go in and, and worship Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We choose to worship you, God. We delight in your presence. shadow you won't light up, a mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, a mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, a mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, a mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's 
no wall you won't kick down a lie you won't tear down coming after me don't deserve it still you give yourself away oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God
Come on, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. 
Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, and never stop working. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Sing it again. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Whoa, we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Jesus. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working, never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Love you today. Come on, church, lift up your voices. Come on, just lift up your voices. Come on. Come on, just love on him this morning. Just love on him. Just love on him because he's worthy. Oh, just worship him. Come on, don't stop. Don't stop. Come on, it's not half time. It's not intermission. Come on, just praise him. Just, just praise him regardless of how you feel, regardless of what you see, regardless of what the world tells you, regardless of what politics says. Just stand up and just say, Jesus, you are my Lord, and I worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. God, we thank you for who you are. Oh, Jesus, we thank you for who you are. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. Early this morning, I, I flipped open my Bible, and uh, I have, if you're like me, your Bible sometimes is a spiritual filing cabinet, right? And you write things in there, and you stuff things in there, and uh, the, the whole idea is to not forget about things. And, and I, I wrote a sermon about 12 years ago called The Four Shores of the King. And I, I actually said that to you guys a couple weeks ago. Hey, come on, that's awesome. Somebody else is in our, in our feed. Hey, so listen. Uh, about 12 years ago, I wrote this sermon called Four Shores of the King. And uh, when I wrote it down, I, my initial thought, I, I actually put it in my Bible and I kept it there. I preached this message to you about two and a half years ago. And, and this morning, I just, I got so passionate because when my Bible opened this morning, it went right to that message, right in that piece of paper. And I just want to remind you of Four Shores of the King. Number one, guess what? The Bible says that he's listening to you. Your prayers aren't going up in your ceiling and then bouncing right back down into your basement. When you pray, He hears you. 
you don't have to go outside where it's wet or cold or hot or muggy to pray because he hears you. Your prayers go right to where he's at. Secondly, the second for sure is this. He will rescue you. Come on, anybody been rescued in the house this morning? Anybody had their foot in the mud and the mire? Anybody had their heart in a place that just was no good? Guess what? The second for sure is that he will rescue you. Thirdly, he will guide you. Did you know his word says that? His word says that uh, he, he, his word is a lamp to what? Your feet and a light to what? Your path. He will guide you. He, he will give you that, that direction that you need. And then the final for sure is this. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, one of the last messages that Jesus preached to just the 12 disciples was this. Be sure of this. I will be with you until the very end of the age. The final for sure. There's a ton of them. I just give you four. The final for sure is this. He will be with you. He's with you. You're not alone. You don't have to be alone. Sometimes we can give God the silent treatment. Come on, somebody. And I think that's where Pastor Jen was headed this morning. Hey, when we skip out on those prayer moments, guess what? We skip out on more prayer moments and more prayer moments and more prayer moments because it's all about muscle memory. As a coach, man, I, I tell the kids all the time, hey, don't forget what it was like to do this or to do that. Just keep doing it over and over and over. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Do you do it without even thinking about it? And I hope that's where you're at. I hope you're in an attitude of prayer in these final uh, uh, 14, 15, 16 days of prayer and fasting for our nation, for our churches, and for our families. Lord, we love you. We thank you for who you are in the mighty, mighty name name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, several of you have been asking for this. Uh, 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 Kimball's closed down, so we can't have ice cream, so I'm feeling like you just need a little something special. Uh, so on Wednesday, November 4th, we're going to have our 2019 annual business meeting, okay? Come on. That's just as good as ice cream, man. Come on, Art, you got saved right there, brother. You got saved right there. Your wife was like, seriously? And you were like, yeah. All right, I know he was just doing that. He doesn't really believe that, but hey, we are going to have that meeting. It's going to be Wednesday night, 7 o'clock right here. Uh, listen, uh, we, it's going to be just like any other service or any other gathering for us because of the, uh, of the virus. Um, so tonight we will have the uh, event out there where you can actually uh, go out and reserve your spot. All the protocols will be in place, okay? We can't do anything about that. So uh, listen, we just need you here, 7 to 8. Uh, the goal is this, because we're not voting on anything. The goal is this, to have about a half hour of business and then about a half hour of praying together. Is that okay? Is that, uh, to me, that's the right business, right? Is just praying together. So uh, listen, we want to be there. Uh, the thing, the reason it's really important on November 4th that we come together and pray is because we're going to have a really good indication of where our country's truly at uh, on that day. <laughs> we're going to have, we're going to know what the next year is going to look like for us uh, based on what happens at 24 hours after the election. So um, I feel like it's super, super important that we come together and pray that night uh, because it's, it's getting on, okay? Our nation's getting on, and God's still got a plan for us. So want to just remind you of that. Also, thank you for those of you that have been given so generously and faithfully to our food pantry. Um, listen, we love it. We had to go through and throw away a bunch of expired things this week. Uh, so make sure that when you're giving, you're, you know, you're buying from the fresh right, right there from the aisles, okay? Don't, don't try to give the church your expired canned goods, all right? Because we have to pan those out because we can't give those away, all right? So uh, we still need your generosity and your help. Thank you so much. We've uh, received almost $500 uh, in our food pantry over the last several weeks, and we're going to be putting together something uh, for some needs that are going to come up during the holiday season. So I just can't thank you enough, church. Uh, it's not going to be what we've always done, uh, but it will be something because we just want to continue to love on people. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, we're in the middle of a, of a, a probably going to be a four or five week series in, entitled An Appeal to Heaven. Uh, don't tell Pastor Jen, she's not up here to keep me in line, so I kind of like it. Uh, next week, I'm not going to be up here to keep her in line. She's preaching next week. But uh, I, I went out and I bought some patches. And so I, I have this concept that's all over me. Uh, it says An Appeal to Heaven. And I can't get rid of this idea that if the church <laughs> would go back to its founding roots and how we were, uh, how we were birthed as a nation, if we would go back to those roots that, that say our nation was birthed out of an appeal to heaven, something would change in our atmosphere. 
Something would completely change. Now, now some people are saying, hey, now's not the time to be preaching Americana. And uh, I, I, I've, I've been thinking about that because we're not citizens of this world. We're citizens of where? Heaven. And so I've been wrestling back and forth, back and forth, and uh, I can't get enough. I, I came into the office several days this week, and, and Wendy was so faithful. She's always here, and, and uh, so she comes in the office, and she's like, Pastor Dan, talk to me about the Black Robe Brigade. I told you about that. I put in my paperwork and just waiting. The Black Robe Brigade is just a, it's just a ministry that's been created for church leaders and pastors to just sign up and say, hey, we want to serve Jesus in these times the same way the, the pastors and the vicar of the Revolutionary War served Jesus. Did you know that many times pastors would stand up with an appeal to heaven uh, to their congregations in the late 1700s to say if our nation's going to stand a chance against religious persecution, we are going to have to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and sometimes preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ is preaching about freedom. And so uh, that, that's where I'm at right now in my life. I, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I don't want to do anything that's going to cause the church to get a fine. But on the same token, man, I, I just don't want to say government, you know best right now. Uh, I want to say Jesus, you know best right now. And I want to keep appealing to heaven because if the church would have never stopped appealing to heaven uh, over 20, uh, 250 years ago, guess what? We wouldn't be in the shot that we are today if we wouldn't have gotten lazy. Come on, I just heard Uncle Tom, one of our founding members at Cornerstone Church, say a big loud amen. I'm thankful for a generation of gray hairs, in Uncle Tom's case, white hair. Uh, and you're losing it too, man. <laughs> it, 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 he said at least he still has hair. I'm thankful for a generation that said, hey, we're going to build, we're going to build the church, and we're going to stay in the church, and we're going to keep praying for the church, and I ain't going anywhere until Jesus calls me home. Amen. And that's an appeal to heaven that I want to be a part of. Then not to let this church go by. I want to show you a quote. I, I, I only give, I've only given you just some of the basics of this quote. I'm going to read a little bit more, but you'll, you'll be able to follow along. It's from author Dutch Sheet Cheats, and he wrote a book entitled An Appeal to Heaven. And if, you, if you're an intercessory or you love to pray, if you just love America, I want to encourage you. You can go right now to Amazon, and you can get this book digitally for about $3. Uh, you can uh, get the actual book for about $15, $16, but this book is really revolutionizing my thought process on what my call is, not just as a pastor, but as an American Christian, <laughs> somebody that loves Jesus inside the boundaries of America. You know, we live in a state that many of our, uh, many of our rules and laws and legislation doesn't really, go against, doesn't really go with Scripture. Have you noticed that? And, and, and my call is not, to, is not to preach damnation to lawmakers. My call is to say, God, would you deliver us in this time? Would you change the course of what's happening? Would you give us just a little bit more time before your judgment comes upon this earth? Listen to what Dutch, Dutch Sheets wrote. He said this, I have great hope for America because the depth of a fall never determines God's ability to restore Come on, aren't you glad? You remember that old commercial, I've fallen and I can't reach my, and you know what the fill in the blank is. I didn't want to say it because somebody get mad at me. I got to stop. Aren't you glad that no matter how far you fall, you're never out of his reach? Amen. Grab that. You are never out of his reach. And that's what Dutch Sheets is saying. He says, I have great hope for America because the depth of the fall never determines God's ability to restore. He goes on, I'm not afraid of the powerful strongholds because size and strength are completely irrelevant when measuring the, his ability to deliver. We're going to talk about the sanctity of life today, and I'm going to give you some things uh, that are going to curdle your milk. Some of you already know these. Some of you have been paying attention for the last several years, but may I just say to you right now that one of the biggest strongholds in the United States of America, but I dare say that's plaguing the entire wor world, is our sanctity of life. And listen, I'm not just talking about abortion. 
I could preach for five, six months on on the evils of abortion, but it's not just abortion. (laughs) About eight, nine, 10, 12 years ago, I've lost count. How many of you know in COVID, you just lose count? Your calendar means nothing right now. I have absolutely, I have no idea how far back it was, but remember this uh, this cool cat out of uh, Michigan, Dr. Death, remember him? Jack Kevorkian? You know, he didn't go after babies. What did he go after? He went after grandparents. Listen, it's a sanctity of life that's not just about babies. It's the whole spectrum of age. America has lost its sanctity of life. And may I dare say that when Dutch Seat says right here that this is a powerful stronghold in size and strength, may I say to you, it's irrelevant to the power of God and his ability to deliver his people. It's irrelevant. It's absolutely irrelevant. He goes on to say, I'm not intimidated because of statistical odds. Come on. (laughs) If you've ever been a gambler, which I pray against you if you are because it's just a waste of money, but uh, you should probably tithe. (laughs) That 10% will take you a lot further than anything in a casino would. But if, if you play the statistical odds in life, let me assure you that it looks like God is not winning. It looks like we're playing catch up. But can I say this? It's all in his plan. Pastor Jay dropped the nuclear bomb on us on Wednesday night. That's just another reason for you to be with us on the wall. Pastor Jay said this. He said, Pastor, I'm I'm convinced that the reason that the foundations of the earth are quaking and shaking and breaking is because heaven is trying to invade earth. Listen, we can't have the presence of God in the totalitarian way that it needs to be in our lives when we've got sin rampant, not just within the world, but within the church. And that's why we're shaking. But he has this power and ability to deliver us. He goes on to say, I'm not intimidated because of the statistical odds. Whether of success or failure, cease to be relevant when God is involved. Listen, his limitless ability negates the very concept of odds and trumps all other winning hands. Now, I I can't tell you who to vote for. But what I will tell you is this book, Appeal to Heaven, was written before President Trump decided to go after uh, the presidency of the United States of America. Listen, may I just be, le- may I level with you for a second, church? And this is going to sound like an endorsement. It's not an endorsement. It's a standing on the word of God. Can I tell you that there's been no president in the history of the United States of America that has stood up against the rights of the unborn like President Donald Trump? May I say this to you? There's been no president in history. (laughs) If you go back uh, three plus years to when I sent my, uh, I didn't even send my resume. My resume was sent to on my behalf. Uh, But I sent another document to this church. And in this document is a personal profile. And it says this, who are the people that you admire? And one of the people that I put on that list of people that I admire is President Ronald Reagan. I was a teenager when he, uh, uh, young, I don't even, I wasn't even a teenager yet, Tim. That's how young I am. Well, I'm not singling you out that you're old, but now I'm in a hole, and so I'm just going to back out. Uh, Listen, I was just a young lad when he became president, and I just remember just vaguely pieces. Why? Because my dad made me watch the news. (laughs) My dad made me pay attention to presidential elections. I remember me hearing people for years and years, still to this day, say there was no president in in our current history like Ronald Reagan. May I say to you that not even the hero Ronald Reagan stood up for the church like President Donald Trump did or has. Listen, I'm not telling you to vote for, but I'm telling you to get in your Bible and realize that President Donald Trump is standing up for more of this right now than any president in our history. (laughs) Five amens. I hope that's not a sign of people that are going to defriend me on Facebook. Listen, I can't help but say what Dutch Seat says one more time. His limitless abilities negate the very concept of of odds and trumps all other winning hands. Church, God is up to something. And it's not our job to like it. It's our job to stay in tune with what God is doing. If you go back and you read the book of, Dari, uh, of Daniel, you will find that Daniel, that you will find that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you will find that many of the major and minor prophets, they had their most fruitful ministry in political places that they did not agree with. But it was these kings that God began to turn their hearts on behalf of his people. 
May we not vote with our emotions, but may we get into this book and may we vote what is in this book. Listen, if you say, well, pastor, I've already voted. Good on you. Now you need to pray like you've never prayed before. Now you need to get on your hands and knees because church, let me assure you, the enemy wants nothing more than to bring America to her knees because this nation was not founded on any other major principle but religious freedom. You go all the way back to the times of Jesus, and he did his whole entire ministry in the shadows of the Roman Empire where he was not free to just do what he needed to do. This nation is free to do what we need to do with Jesus. Did you know that there's no other nation right now that gives money to missions like the United States of America? Did you know that? You know, you can go into any third world country right now in America and you will find Red Cross type first aid hospitals. Uh, and guess who they're funded by? America. Guys, we have to understand that God is not concerned with the odds because he's God. Dutch goes on to say in the days of the flags, and he references the flag that we have flying here this morning, an appeal to heaven. In the days of the flag's genesis or the beginning, the American colonists had no choice, uh, no, excuse me, no chance of winning a war with the world's greatest empire, Great Britain. Chance, however, lost its relevance once they chose, grab this church, this is tweetable if you have Twitter, chance, however, lost its relevance once they chose to appeal to heaven over their impending fate. The revolutionaries of the 1770s, they looked at us as a nation and they said, there's no way we're going to win this war. But it's worth an appeal to heaven and it's worth giving our lives for. May I say to you, church, this morning, that in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of not being able to hug and clap and high-five each other like we want to, that it is worth fighting for the soul of a nation. <laughs> my ears, if you've been married more than five years and you're a husband, your ears just naturally tune into your wife's voice. I'm not saying anything about that. I'm just saying that we like to listen to our wives talk. <laughs> I heard my wife come in this morning to the sanctuary. The very first thing I heard her ask was another lady in our church, is it okay if I hug you? What kind of place are we in where we have to ask to show love? Church, we got to defy the odds. Dutch Sheets goes on to say, when these ill-prepared and poorly equipped revolutionaries appealed for assistance from the giver of inalienable rights, did you know that that's what the founding documents of our world, you know those documents, you know the documents, uh, uh, those documents, right? It's our inalienable God-given right, and they based it on the fact that God said, let there be light. These are not principles that we tried to tie into the church. These are principles that come out of the written, spoken word of God. You've heard your pastor say so many times, the greatest nation on the earth is Israel because it's God's chosen people. I've often thought about, Jen, let's pack up the kids and let's just move to Israel. But if I can't live in Israel, boy, I'm sure glad I live in these United States of America because of the inalienable rights that were given to us by our creator, not by President George Washington and the First Continental Congress. They were given to us by who? By God. He goes on to say, then they agreed to come under God's governance and honor his ways. He who, listen, again, you know the document, he says this, who governs in the affairs of men. As Ben Franklin stated to that first constitutional, constitutional convention, did just that. Affirming God's governing intervention, Franklin said this, it'll be on your screens, all of us who were engaged, Ben Franklin, did you know he was not a Christ follower? Now, I don't know what he said in his own personal life. I don't know what he did when he was about to meet Jesus face to face, all right? But he is not known for his upstanding living. Okay? If you don't know that, just get, on, just get on Wikipedia. Even Wikipedia will tell you. All right? This guy didn't have all of his P's and Q's in an order, but this is what he said. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of superintending providence in our favor. 
That's a man who doesn't want to admit to God, and he used the word providence. Providence is something that comes from supernatural or heavenly places. And this man who didn't live his life as a believer said, you cannot see in the founding of our nation that there was not a, a, a supernatural providence that came down from heaven on our behalf. And I'm here to say to you as the church of 2020, it is time that we go back to that providence. It is time that we begin to get back to the place where we really Really, truly are all about appealing to heaven. He says this, even some of our founders, this is Dutch speaking, even some of our founders who were not strong Christians, such as Franklin, acknowledge God's providential hand in the victory of the United States, and to prove it, they put it on a flag. To prove it, they put it on a flag. They prove it to put it on a flag. I told you, man, I, I couldn't wait to get this up, man. I was just so excited. I'm so giddy. I, I still haven't got mine for my house, but it's coming. I, I just, I, I, I want the whole world to know that, yes, I fly a United States of American flag on my porch or on the church parsonage porch, but may I tell you that right beside that soon is going to be an appeal to heaven because the church, the nation, our family should be in an ever state of appealing to heaven. May we not forget. This morning, I want to continue on in this series, using this flag as the kind of the canvas, the heart and soul of what we need to be, mixed with this verse found in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Many of you know it uh, by heart or have most of it memorized. He says this, the Bible says this, then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn for their wicked ways. Boy, that's a lot of buy-in on his people, isn't it? Listen, we have to humble ourselves. Can I say to you what we've been talking about literally for a year and a half? It's not about us. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, it's not about you. <laughs> Make sure that neighbor says it back to you. It's not about you either. <laughs> we got to humble ourselves. We have to pray. That's why we're doing the appeal to the heaven. That's why we're in 23 days of prayer and fasting for our nation and for our churches and for our families. We have to pray. Listen, we have to seek my face. Pastor Jen's coming next week, and she's going to be talking about biblical literacy as it relates to our nation's founding, as it relates to the fall of our nation. She's going to talk a little bit about how they pulled the Bible out of schools and what happened. Everything went crazy. Listen, we have to seek his face. You will not seek his face. You will not pray if you do not know what he already says. Get in your word. Get in your word. Turn from your wicked ways. Can I be an adult for you today? Can I just be a man to you today? Can I not be pastor for just a brief second? There's a couple times over the last five or six days where my flesh went to sin. Come on, anybody there with me? Anybody thought about something they shouldn't have thought of? Anybody went to say something they knew they shouldn't have said? Anybody did anything that they knew they shouldn't have done? I'm not talking about the bad sins. I'm just talking about those sins that we don't even pay attention to. And then it was like a bad taste came to my mouth. <laughs> Listen, it's just not enough to humble yourself, to pray, and to seek his face. We have to turn from our ways. You know that's why everybody had an issue with President Trump holding up that Bible. Remember that? <laughs> Listen, I've been in the ministry long, and President Trump's been in politics. I've never seen a pastor hold up a Bible like this before. <laughs> I laughed. I got to be honest with you. I, I, I love it when he talks about 1 John. He doesn't say 1 John. He says 1 John. <laughs> I'm like, there was only one John? No, there was like three in the Bible. <laughs> Listen, I know he's not, <laughs> he's not where most of us are at. But listen, may we not look at somebody else's sin and say to ourselves, they don't deserve. May we say that, but for the grace of God, there go I. That's part of humbling ourselves. <laughs> Do you know that the other side of the aisle that's running for president, vice president, former vice president, Joe Biden, did you know that he says he's a religious man? Did you know that? Did you know he says he goes to church? Did you know that? Did you know that he says that he personally <laughs> uh, does not believe in abortion? Did you know that? Yet his own voting record shows that he stands on the side day in and day out of abortion on demand. Did you know that? Did you know that the own church that he goes to, not important what denomination, but did you know that the own church that he goes to says that he's not within good standing? 
Church, I, it's not about picking a political party. It's about getting it right in the word of God. And can I assure you today that if the roles were reversed, I'd say the same thing. If it was Joe Biden that was saying, hey, no more abortion. Hey, church, uh, uh, no more persecution for religion and, and have religious freedom. And if it was Donald Trump that was saying, let's kill babies and let's shut churches down. Can I tell you that from this pulpit on this day, with what God has put in my heart, I would be saying the same thing for pro-Vice uh, uh, President Biden. Why? Because it's not about my preference. It's about the soul of a nation. He goes on, Chronicles says this, after we turn from our wicked ways, it says, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. Church, it's not about what unsaved people do. <laughs> it's about what saved people do. Saved people know how to humble themselves. Saved people know how to pray. Saved people know how to seek his face. Saved people know how to fight against temptation. He didn't say people that are not saved. He said, if my people will do these things, then he will hear from heaven and he will heal the land and restore. So church, I gotta be honest with you, it's our time. It, now, now's, your, now's your ticket. Your card's punched. The coach is calling you off the bench. <laughs> you just got hired for a new promotion. It is your time to do what the word of God says. It's not just a verse that we can quote in times of peril in hopes that God will get us through unprecedented times and will relieve the pain and the suffering and the hurt that our nation has or that we have. This scripture is a truth and it's a promise and it's universal for all time. It was not written for the nation of Israel uh, thousands of years ago. It was written for the nation of Israel thousands of years ago and for the United States of America in 2020. It's a universal promise. Don't get caught up in religion that says the Old Testament was simply for the old church. Listen, I, I've been close to that a couple times. And then when I get into the Word of God, I realize that what the Word of God says in 2 Chronicles, it talks about in First and 2 Corinthians. It says the same thing, it just speaks in a different language. Remember this morning that the goal in the heart of this flag and appeal to heaven, it's a trumpet call for the pulpit of Christ's church, for the church to stand for the things of God, the mandates to his church, and the promises of favor when we put our eyes in the direction of Jesus and not our own personal desires and preference. Not our own. I, I, I make the super elementary point in reminding you, I love a certain kind of coffee. And I have to travel to get it because I don't have one close. Listen, I can't drink other kinds of coffee because it messes up my body. When we got here, one of the things we did is we said, hey, let's give $5 gift cards to that place that America's fueled on. You know what I'm talking about? All right, let's give $5 gift cards to every visitor that comes into the house of Cornerstone Church. Listen, that's not my preference. But I do what I need to do to bless people that that is their preference, even if it's not what I want. Do you hear that? It's time for the church to stop living their life based on our preference and start living our lives based on what's good for people. In January of 1973, the highest court of the land ruled seven to two that abortion would be legal in this land. In January of 1973, my mom got pregnant out of wedlock. Boy, it's quiet in here. You see, my mom could have made a different decision. And it would have changed your history. And you don't even know my mom because she passed away in 2009. But my mom's single decision who none of you have ever met with the exception of my son and my wife in the room, changed your life. Can you see what abortion has done to the American culture? The lives that have not been changed because the enemy, like he tried to do, <laughs> those faithful, fateful, not faithful, fateful nights where Mary and Joseph chose to flee Bethlehem out of fear of Herod finding baby Jesus to snuff out the light that should not be hidden under a bushel. 
You see, it's my opinion that this opened the question to the United States of America that God was not asking, what about the sanctity of life? What about the sanctity of life? That question was answered in such a grotesque way in January 22nd, 2019. Zach, if you'll go ahead and throw that picture up. This is a picture of the New York governor and the New York state legislator and New York special interest and lobbyist group signing a document that was entitled the Human Reproductive Act. Boy, that's a great act, isn't it? This act right here, do you see their smiles on their face? (laughs) This act right there said, in New York, it's okay to have abortion no matter the month of pregnancy. This, this act right here that was supposed to help human reproductive, this act said that a baby could be born, put on the birthing table, and they could go deal with the mom or other things and just let the baby die right there on the table. Boy, that's nothing but just pure evil. Just pure evil. Now, I don't even want to get into the politics of it. Will you just look at the smiles on their faces? the smiles on their faces, that's what grieves me the most. And I'm not even God. I I don't even understand how God feels when, when, when American people who have civility and supposed to understand code and honor and well-being and generosity and love for human race, I don't even understand how God feels when he looks down on his creation and they laugh about snuffing out the life of ones that have barely had the chance to breathe. I don't get it. I don't get it. I just don't get it. What about the sanctity of life? We as a nation have lost it, church. Did you know that Marxism is invading our land? Did you know that? I did doing some research on Marxism. And here's what I found in my own research. That since its inception, Roughly 200 years ago is when Karl Marx was born. It hasn't been around 200 years because obviously he had to get pretty beat up to come up with some philosophies that he did. So let's call it 150 years, give or take. Did you know that since the birth of Marxism in the mid to late 19th century, it's estimated by many that well over 150 million deaths have occurred simply because of Marxist views. And they don't know that this number is really true because they really can't get a count in Russia. They really can't get a count in China. They really can't get an accurate anything coming out of North Korea. So they're just guessing. But there's documented over 96 million deaths because of Marxism. And then you add another 60,000 onto that in guesstimation, church. May I tell you that the thing that has caused a global death pandemic around the world is now invading America, and it's not doing it slyly anymore. It's coming up to your front door, and it's knocking on your front door, and it's saying, if you do certain things, Marxism will take over. Boy, I'm going to lose friends on Facebook. Do you know Glenn Beck was a Mormon? you know who Glenn Beck is? If you're a Republican, you love him. If you're a Democrat, you hate him. He was a Mormon. I didn't listen to him because his theology was backwards. He, he got divorced, and then he remarried, and he apologized on national radio to his wife for divorcing her because he had all of his issues wrong. He apologized to his children on syndicated national radio because he knew as a dad, he had made the worst grievous sin he could do as a dad. He remarried, and the a woman that he remarried, they ended up patching their lives together, and, and Glenn Beck has since given his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so I, I, I've been reading some Glenn stuff. I've been listening to some Glenn stuff. And uh, uh, boy, I got to work hard to keep it out of my sermons, okay? Because you, you don't pay me to preach Glenn. You pay me to preach the word. The other day he said this on national radio. He said, if your pastor is not preaching against Marxists, leave it and go to a different church. And I, I wrote it down and I thought, I wonder why a guy would say that. And so I started reading on why a guy would say that. And basically what I found is that the pastors that used to preach in the pulpits in our land in the 1700s, they preached against Marxism before it was Marxism. They preached against church, may I say this to you, against religious persecution. The Bible says that Jesus came to give what? And how life? Abundantly. And Marxism flies in the face of life and life more abundantly, church. It's now time, like never before, that the church stops trying to fill its pews and we start trying to fill heaven's door with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not by doing another church event, church. Events do not work. They don't work. They just get people in the door for free candy at Halloween. They just bring people in to see some cute this or that at a holiday season. It doesn't work. What works is when we begin to live our lives in a way where people see Jesus in us. Listen, I, 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 I just quote myself all the time because if I quote it and tell you, then I know I won't be misquoted because you heard it straight from the horse's mouth. Went to Starbucks the other day with my wife. We had a little date. I drink, she doesn't. <laughs> The benefits of not being healthy. I walk in because it's pouring down rain. And I walk in and the lady's name there, uh, I, I, I met her when I first moved here. She's the manager. She walked in. She goes, every time we get a mobile order by the name Dan, we think it's you. And then when the guy comes in to pick it up, because, you know, uh, most times when I'm not in the church, I'm usually wearing a baseball cap. And now that you got a mask, really all you can see is my, my eyes. And so they don't always know who the person is coming to grab their coffee. But when this other Dan comes in and he grabs the drink, he goes, they said to me, we knew it wasn't you. And so I asked them this yesterday, a couple days ago, I said, well, how do you know it's not me? They said, well, the first reason is because he doesn't work alone. If you know me well, you know you can smell me before I get there. <laughs> and if you know me really well, you know that you smell me after I leave. <laughs> when I first got here, John Russell and I were goofing around, and we made a little video, and I put on one of our ladies' coats uh, as we were trying to hang a star, and she, they, she had to go get it dry clean because it smelled like me. She didn't want anything to get started, you know? Listen, <laughs> she goes, that was the first reason I knew we knew it wasn't you, but then the second reason was this, because you just are happy all the time. I said, well, boy, don't tell, say that in my family. <laughs> we'll say that to some people in my church because they probably wouldn't agree with you. But here's what I did walk out of there with my chest a little bit pumped up, was that at least people that don't know Jesus see something different in me. And church, it's time. Our last series right before this appeal to heaven was bring your one. Church, it is so stinking important that you latch on to this. I, I have to tell you, baseball practice, listen, I know you're tired of me talking about sports. You just have to get over it because it's my life. <laughs> I love it. You love it. You live in New England. You don't like one sport. You like four. You just go, they just back to back to back to back to back. I can't keep up. <laughs> one of my little eight-year-olds comes up to me in practice on Thursday night. And it wasn't a great practice. My son almost took a ball to the head. Isaiah wasn't there because he had to do something else. It was just, everything was just off. Have you ever been there? We're just off. So we, we got through the practice without anybody getting hurt. Praise the Lord. <laughs> we did our little, we did our, my parents don't make me social distance. Thank you, Jesus. So we're all huddled up together, breaking all the rules. Almost every practice, we give the kids an opportunity to say something. And one of the kids said, hey, coach. And I said, yeah. And he said, we just went on vacation for my birthday. He missed a game for it. <laughs> here's where it was all worth it he said hey coach when we got to the hotel room I was going through the drawers at the hotel I'm thinking to myself why you're never going to find anything there they clean those things out anyway he said 
coach, there was a Bible. And he goes, I asked my mom to read it. And I loved it because Ian was sitting right there. And Ian goes, well, what book did you read? <laughs> and one of the coaches goes, the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> and so Ian goes, what story did you read? And the boy goes, it was really cool. Some dude named Joseph, Jesus, Jesus, and he couldn't get Jesus' name out. He goes, some dude walked on water. <laughs> I thought, what a great introduction to meet Jesus the first time. Walking across water, because he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. May I say to you, church, I, I never tell my kids that I read the Bible. They know I'm a pastor, but I don't come in and start every practice with a sermon out of the Bible. I don't talk about Jesus, but they just instinctively know that something's different. In a world that's lost the sanctity of life, we have to live differently. I got to get moving. I have no clue what time it is. I told Jen, I said, I, I realize why this message, that's why she's not preaching with me for the three, at least three of them, is because this message has really been in me for 15 years. She wasn't going to be able to say a word. <laughs> Let me knock into this thing. I got about 10 minutes, 12 minutes. The sanctity of life covers three things. Number one, it covers abortion, it covers murder, and then it covers death. Matthew chapter two, verses 13 through 18 say this, after the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, get up and flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said, stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And then you know the rest of the story. They flee, they go to Egypt. Go, you can go read that. It's Matthew 2, 13 through 18. Church, I, I, I want to say to you, <laughs> you know, our, our Catholic friends, they take a beating on certain things. One, one of my friends, he's Catholic, goes to a, a parish here in, in town, and he says this, he goes, Pastor, if you just open a bar in your basement, your church grow overnight. That's why we come to a Catholic church, because they got a bar in the basement. It's like, oh, novel idea. I don't think it'll work, though. <laughs> anyway, our Catholic friends take a beating on some things, but they get some things right. I want you to look at this picture. This picture is called the Holy Innocence. This picture was painted in 1616. It's, it's all distorted and everything because of how we have to translate everything down. I apologize for that. Uh, this picture was painted in 1616 by a, 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 Catholic, uh, a Catholic leader by the name of Peter Paul Rubens. And, and what I want you to see here in this picture is you see Mother Mary in the dead center of the picture. Obviously, we know that in the Catholic faith that Mary has a real significant role in what Catholics believe. And you'll see that there's a baby in her arms. Any guess as to who that baby might be? Uh, baby Jesus. But then what you see all around uh, uh, the, the Holy Mother, as they call her, uh, and, and, and the Christ child, what you see is you see all these babies. Do you know what these babies represent? These babies represent the babies that were killed on the time that Jesus was born. And Herod said, I'm going to snuff out a light that wasn't meant to be put under a bushel. And I think that if the Catholic Church would, would, would get somebody to paint the holy innocence today, that there's not a church cathedral ceiling big enough that they could put all the babies that are holy innocents that have never been given the chance to take a breath. And listen, the reason why abortion is a plague in our land is because it all started when the enemy said, I'm going to take Jesus out. It, it, it never got eradicated. Why? Because we don't fight against flesh and blood. Come on. How many of you have to remind yourself that every day? I, I had to just tell Isaiah the other day. I was just like, buddy, I'm a horrible example of this, but man, we don't fight against flesh and blood. Remember that. Church, until the enemy has no more power on this planet, and that day will come when Jesus comes back and there's a thousand year reign, uh-oh, he better get something going on because after that thousand years, buddy, he's toast. So until that moment, the enemy of our souls will be trying to snuff out your kids and great-grandkids great and grandchildren all the way down and up the line because he doesn't want the light to be lit, but he wants the light to be put under a bushel. Abortion's always going to be here. It will never be legislated out of our culture because America has lost the sanctity of life. Let me say this. Murder. 
you can't get into the book of Genesis, the opening book of the book. You can't get in but to four chapters before you hear about murder. Genesis chapter four, verse two. Now Abel kept the flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the curse, excuse me, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought the offering. It was fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Make sure you know these were animals, not people, okay? The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Do you catch this, that there's laws that God puts into play? And one of the original laws of Genesis, uh, the book of Genesis, is that when you were going to do a sacrifice, it wasn't of grain or green or fruit or vegetable. It was of blood and flesh of certain kinds of animals. If you didn't have it, what did you do? You traded your apple so you could go get it. And God is such a merciful God that he didn't say you had to go get the largest elephant on the planet. He said there are times where if you'll just go buy a little turtle dove and you'll go through the sacrificial rituals that I've asked you to, a little dove will take care of what it needs to take care of. So it's not even as if Cain would have had to struggle to go find the correct animal to give to God. Can I translate that to you and I today? Many times, and I, Pastor Jen didn't even look at my message. She's like, I'm not preaching. I don't need to read it. You hang yourself, she said. No, she didn't say that. Listen, she didn't say that. She's, I'm in trouble. Coach, I need a bear, you got a spare bedroom for me, right? All right. I'll even wear a mask, okay? Listen, many times, as Pastor Jen said, we overlook those moments of prayer. What we're really doing is we're trying to outthink God, <laughs> and he's given us a way to succeed but we choose not to do it because it's not easy or it's not comfortable or it's not what we want or the 75 cents to go buy a turtle dove. We don't want to spend that. We'd rather go put it in a slushy or a cup of coffee or if you're John Russell and I, a hamburger with a chocolate shake. Why? I do the hamburger. He does the chocolate shake. The Lord looked at favor with Abel and his offering, but on Cain, his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain grew angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you, don't, if you do what is right, you will, not, will you not be accepted? Isaiah, have you ever heard me say that? Just do what's right, dude. Just do the right thing. Listen, but if you do what is not right, sin is crouching at your door. Sin is crouching. If you do the wrong thing, church, sin is at your door. We're going to get into sin here in just a moment as we close. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Four chapters into the Bible, and we see this thing called murder. In the time of civil unrest that we live in, in 2020, largely because everybody's emotions are out of whack because of the pandemic, Did you know that murder rates all over the country, north, south, east, and west, are skyrocketing? If you watch Fox News, Fox News blames it on Democratic mayors and governors. If you watch CNN, they blame it on Republican Senate and Republican president. I want to blame it on something different. I want to blame it on the fact that America has more into sinning than we are turning our face to God. Because it was in major perilous times of persecution that you see the church explode in the midst of of political nonsense and pain. Church, it is time for us to do what God has asked us to do and stop running away from truth. Listen, the final thing here is death. America's lost its sanctity of life. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 23. For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Jesus Christ when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. What does Romans chapter 6 say about sin? For sin is what? The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. 
And, and, and Paul's telling the church in Rome right here that Jesus has freed us. Uh, Paul hasn't even written chapter 6 yet, and he's saying uh, the, the, the penalty has been freed to you. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe in Jesus, who sacrificed his life and shed his blood. This sacrifice shows that God is fair. Come on, it's not just Fox News that's fair and balanced. It's Jesus is the original fair and balanced. God doesn't want to see us in death and, and pain and sin. He wants to see us free. The very fact that shows that we are not free is our murder rates. I'm thankful that I live in north central Massachusetts where murder is not our thing right now. But I assure you, church, I assure you that it's coming. Because Marxism takes away the value of life even further. Marxism replaces religious freedom with religious tyranny. It's coming in our direction. May I say to you, I can't for time, you go home and you read Romans 3, 23 through 26. Death is a result of the fall. Romans 5 says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. I, I, <laughs> so much I want to say to you this morning. Isn't it interesting that in chapter 4 of Genesis, we see the first murder? But it was actually in chapter 2 of Genesis where we see Adam take a bite of the apple that really caused the sin of the world to be birthed as it is today. You ever catch that? It was the sin of a little apple. It probably wasn't an apple, but that's just easy for us to understand. Got several people that work with the Knowltons at uh, their nephew's uh, apple orchard, Restoration Farms. You, if you go to Hannaford, you can buy their apples there. I want some kickback, Betty, of cider or something. <laughs> We get it because of the apples that we pick or that we buy because we see them all over. It was the picking and eating of an apple that caused this. And the reason it caused it was because God said, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. He goes on to say in Romans chapter 5 and verse 13, yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was no law to break. Verse 14, still everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit command of God as Adam did. Now God is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come, but there's a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. Praise the Lord. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought the death to many, but even greater of God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through the uh, other man, Jesus Christ. Verse 16, and as the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of one man's sin. I can't keep reading all this because it's really, it's really powerful to understand and it takes a lot of time to unpack. But basically, aren't you glad that the power of Adam's sin is nowhere near as much as the power of God's grace? Does that sound a little bit like what author or Dutch sheets said as we opened up in service, that it doesn't matter how far you fall and God can restore you. It doesn't matter what odds are against you. God is not a God of the odds. <laughs> God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and nothing shakes him. So how do we bring back the sanctity of life? Listen, here's the real way you know I'm closing because I'm closing the books. Romans chapter 6. Verse 20 says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do what's right. Zach, if you'll start playing us some music. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do. Things that end in eternal doom. I hope this week when you go home today, that those little sins of eating the apple will begin to be distasteful to you. Because we've got the prayer part kind of figured out. we got the humble part kind of figured out. We, we, we've got those things where we seek his face kind of figured out. We often forget about the turn from our wicked ways. Verse 22, but now you are free from the power of sin. And you become slaves to God. I want to unpack this for you. 
as you begin to prepare to leave. Slaves in those days and the references in the book of Romans were not slaves like we think in context of early American history. Many slaves in the context in which Paul wrote to the church in Rome were slaves that chose to remain slaves to certain households after they had been given their freedom because what they did is they found family and life and love in this person that purchased them or that paid for them. Many times, slaves would actually get the same rights as sons and daughters within the home. So what Paul is saying here is as a slave of God, you and I are choosing to say, I will stay submitted to him. I will humble myself. I will pray. I will seek his face. And I will turn from my wicked ways. Therefore, I am choosing to be a slave to God. Now you do these things that lead to holiness. The result is eternal life. How do we bring back the sanctity of life in America? By simply humbling ourselves, praying, seeking our face, and turning from our wicked ways. Church, you and I will never be able to vote out abortion. We will never be able to vote out murder. We will never be able to vote out death because it is a result of sin and the fall. But what we can do is we can pray. We can seek his face. We can humble ourselves. And we can turn from our wicked ways so that we can inherit eternal life. And then Paul says the famous, fateful sometimes, encouraging in others. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. One of the things that I've learned to do as a husband is I've learned to like HGTV. She now doesn't have to tell me to turn there. I just automatically turn there. I don't even know if it's HGTV, it might be Discovery. Do you know that show, Love It or List It? Come on, you know more about that than you do the Bible, some of you. I'm, I'm addicted to that show. I cannot watch that show and turn it off in mid-show. I have to see Hillary's result. I have to see David's counter to try to just punch it to Hillary. It was so bad the other day we were watching one, we had to get up and leave. I recorded it so I'd go back and watch the end of it. <laughs> it's bad, Art. Bacon, like it or list it. It's up there, man. Can I close with this thought that has absolutely nothing to do with an appeal to heaven? We don't serve a God that tells us, love it or list it. You don't have to pick with him, but you do have to pick him. He doesn't give you the options of pleasing, permissible, perfect. He gives you the option, me. Catch that with me, if you will. Some of you got, well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that there's a, a permissible, a pleasing, and a perfect will. Yeah, if, if you read it in its totalitarian, if you read it in its context, Paul's not saying it's one of the three. What he's saying is that God is the permissible. God is the pleasing. God is the perfect. You don't love it or list it. You just pick him. And then you pray. You humble yourself. You pray. You seek his face. And then you turn from your wicked ways. That's a life that's being led as an appeal to heaven. Will you pray with me this week specifically for our nation, our churches, and our families? Because the enemy is trying to take all three of them out. And I don't want to stand by when I know I could appeal to heaven and change the tides of destiny for just a little bit longer to see people come to know him 
before they pass on to eternal judgment. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are. Lord, I thank you for a house filled with people, God, that, Lord, largely, you can see it in their eyes, Father. They want to pray. They want to humble themselves. They want to pray. They want to seek your face. And, Lord, they're desirous of turning from their wicked ways. God, help us to be 2 Chronicles seven fourteen Christians. Father, so that we can live our life with the idea that there is sanctity of life. Lord, may we speak life with our tongue. I didn't even talk about that today, God. The power of life and death within the tongue. May we speak life. Father, may we speak life to our spouses. May we speak life to our kids. May we speak life to our family, our workmates. Father, people we know, people we don't. May our tongues be instruments of life and not death. Lord, we love you. We thank you for who you are. That you're a giver of good gifts. And Lord, we thank you that that's who we are. Loved by you. Lord, it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. If you're with us online, thanks so much for being with us this morning. If you'd like to accept Christ or you'd like to know more about what it means to live a life uh, with an appeal to heaven, one of our staff pastors and leaders of our church would love to spend some time with you, hook up with you and give you some direction and some companionship. I'd like to get you a Bible. That's really the first start is getting his word inside of you. Pastor Jen's going to be preaching that next week. Listen, we love you. Know that somebody's praying for you every day here at Cornerstone Church. And we're so grateful to have you with us today. God bless you. I hope you have a good day. We'll see you next week.